Um, so speaking of that, I'm going to kind of, I'm reflecting now on, on your story, on your ancestor, Patrick Sneed, I believe. Yes. Um, so could you remind me of the, of the Patrick Sneed story? If I recall, he's from Savannah, Georgia. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, he was born in Savannah around 1822. Um, and, um, he uh, um, was of mixed ancestry, um, part Jewish, Cherokee, African, um, and Irish. Um, he was almost virtually white in appearance from descriptions of him, but he was enslaved because he was of African descent. And um, he escaped uh, to Canada with his half brother, a man named Adam Mendenhall, in 1849. And um, um, gets to Canada, is there for uh, several years, but um, had difficulty finding work. So um, during the summer months, he would actually return to the U.S. to Niagara Falls, uh, where he worked at a Grand Hotel as a waiter and felt relatively safe <clears throat> doing that and being, you know, close to the border. But of course, um, someone saw him and recognized him from Savannah, of course, small world. And um, he was arrested. Um, but not under the fugitive slave law because his owner um, uh, back in Savannah had tried for several years to capture him and was unable to. Um, so instead of trying to capture him under the fugitive slave law, he um, told authorities in um, Niagara Falls that he was actually a fugitive from justice, um, that he was wanted under a charge of murder back in Savannah. And so he was uh, arrested for that, uh, taken to Buffalo, put on a trial. And during um, the first day or two of the trial, um, the judge was looking at the evidence and it didn't quite seem to match up. So he called, uh, called, um, uh, telegraphed the court in Savannah and um, the judge there um, said, yes, I know Patrick Sneed, I've known him since he was a boy. And in fact, the judge was his cousin. Mm. Um, he said, uh, he's a runaway slave. You can return him for that. Um, but he's not a fugitive from justice. He, there's wow. no warrants or any um, indication that he ever killed anyone. Um, and so the judge um, uh, in New York threw out the case. Um, and then he escaped the courtroom you know, fled from the courtroom as a second charge is coming in as a runaway slave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we couldn't get him under that one. So That's let's true. go back to the original. Um, but he had already left and got over to Canada. Um, and then he came back um, during, um, on Sherman's march uh, to uh, Savannah um, in 1864. And um, help liberate the town he initially escaped from. So um, I never even knew his story. Um, when um, I started researching my family history in the uh, early 90s, um, I came across a court transcript uh, 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 for my great-great-grandfather, who was a free Black man named Jackson Sheptel. And in his 52-page court transcript, uh, he makes mention of an uncle, Patrick Sneed, who he said came with the Union Army. And I, I remember reading it 
one time and saying, that's odd. If it was his uncle and he's from Savannah, how would he come with the Union Army? And then I thought, oh, maybe as they were coming in the city, he just kind of like joined the parade, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, but uh, and then I kind of forgot about it. And then um, a few years later, um, um, I did this, you know, I did two walks to Canada in 1996 from Maryland to Canada as a extension of a project that I did for my undergrad, uh, documenting routes of the Underground Railroad in my county, Maryland, and decided I would follow one of those routes. So I walked to Canada that year. And then two years later, I did a second route from Alabama to Canada with the intention of making a documentary. Um, and when I got to Canada, I found a book called The North Side View of Slavery, uh, which was interviews with um, fugitives who had um, moved to Canada. And um, here it was, uh, for instance, it was the book uh, first interview uh, with Harriet Tubman in uh, wow. 1856. Yeah, very brief interview and also interviews with her brother. Well, in the book, um, I see this interview with this guy named Patrick Sneed, and he says he's from Savannah. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at that and said, oh, that name is familiar. I must have seen this book somewhere else. And I just closed it and sent it back to the stacks. And then maybe three months later, when I was back home, like in the middle of the night, I was like, I know that name. It's on my family tree. Oh, yeah. And so I'm going through files at three in the morning and I found it. And then I spent a couple of years trying to stitch together and see if the Patrick Sneed in my great great grandfather's court testimony was the same Patrick Sneed in the uh, book of uh, you know the narratives in Canada, and it was I was able to to figure it out. And uh, then I realized as I started putting together and tracing his story and his route that I had in 1996 crossed into Canada from Buffalo at the very same spot he did. Um, that was weird. <laughs> Two years before I knew about him getting to Canada. So wow. that's story in a nutshell. <laughs> so you said Patrick Sneed was your great, great. Grand uncle. Grand uncle. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, and if you go to the, um, there is a um, Underground Railroad Museum at Niagara Falls that opened a few years ago um, um, in a building which is now uh, part of the Amtrak um, station there. Um, it was like the old customs house and um, from that time, and it features... Uncle Patrick's story. Wow. That's one of the chief stories there. So. Wow. so how did you find out that you crossed at the same point in, in, in Niagara Falls? <clears throat> yeah, so um so when I crossed in 96, it was at a place called Black Rock Landing. And um the reason I crossed there was as I was traveling the eight weeks from Maryland to Canada, my journey was being tracked um, on a national park website. Um, um, Network to Freedom was starting to form. And um, so in 1995, um, uh, Vince DeForest, uh, who headed the program at the time or was working on the program at the time. He never headed it, I don't think. But um, but he said, um, you know, if you're going to be traveling to any national parks, we would like to support you. So they put up my itinerary and people could follow and they could send emails to the national park site. And then those were relayed to me on the road. 
So people put me up in their houses along the way. It was re really amazing. But behind the scenes, some historians in Buffalo and their counterparts in Canada contacted the national parks and said, hey, when Tony reaches here, we have an idea. Instead of him crossing one of the bridges, why don't we work with uh, US customs and Canadian customs and get permission for him to cross by boat at Black Rock Landing, where which was the slave crossing. And um, of course, this was all secret. I had no idea this was going to happen, <laughs> which is kind of fun. <laughs> so when I got there, um, the group said, you know, yeah, you're here for two days and then you're going to cross, but we have a surprise for you. So they took me down to Black Rock Landing and the U.S. immigration officer was standing by the river. She asked me for my passport. She stamps it there, like on the banks of the river. Wow. Um, they told me that I was the first uh, person um, to legally cross there in something like 40 years. Oh. It was incredible. And when I got to the other side, the Canadian counterparts were waiting on the landing at a place called Fort Malden. Well, later when I found um, the North Side view of slavery and which includes uh, Steve's account opening in court, um, he said, um, you know, he raced from the court into a carriage um, and um, uh, uh, crossed over into Canada. And um, the chief historian who I was dealing with in Canada said, yeah, there was one place um, outside of Buffalo where uh, fugitives crossed because the um, uh, uh, ferry boat captains would give them free passage. And they, they said it's a place called Black Rock Landing. And I'm like, oh, wow. Um, okay. I was just there. <laughs> I was just there. <laughs> just there. <laughs> it was really, really, yeah, I, I was just like, all right. No yeah. need to explain. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, uh, as I like to say, um, at that point, um, you know, the Underground Railroad uh, that I had gone in search of uh, seemed to be coming in search of me, so. Wow. And was this your first trip or your second trip? That was the first trip. Wow. And um, strangely enough, on my second trip, I go from Mobile, Alabama, three months through 10 states to Detroit. And then the people in Detroit had arranged the same type of crossing. So I actually crossed by kayak. Um from uh, Detroit over to the Canadian side at a place called uh, Fort Malden. And after um, kind of finding out about my uncle, um, it took several years, but um, I found out that he actually, when he first escaped to Canada, ended up in Fort Malden. Um, uh, or I can't figure out, it's like, it was like a year and a half to two years. Um, and that he may have been working on a ship that went from Malden to Detroit, um, uh, bearing, uh, fugitives. So, um, it's kind of weird on both trips. I ended up crossing at places that he crossed. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> that's amazing. That's really, really cool. I think that's what, that made my, I remember learning that when you said that the first time, I think that made my favorite part of the story. <laughs> Cross at the same place he crossed twice. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 
So um, you talked a little bit about, about, about your journey walking the trip. So could you talk a little bit more about how that came to be? You mentioned how it came from a, an undergraduate project. Can you talk more about how that kind of developed? Yeah, so um, I graduated from um, American University in 1994. I was a returning student. I graduated from high school in 82. Um, but then finally returned to college. And uh, for my senior project, um, I had to document, write a paper documenting some aspect of uh, African American history that had gone unrecorded. So I chose the Underground Railroad um, because I lived in Maryland and um, volunteered on the weekends at our uh, county's historical society. Mm -hmm. I thought, let me pick a topic that I can do my research while I'm on the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I don't even know how, what made me think of the Underground Railroad, but, you know, I knew Maryland was a slave state. I knew it was a border state um, and that the northern point of our county was 40 miles below the Mason-Dixon line. So I was like, okay, there should be some underground railroad people escaping through here, whatnot. So um, I worked on that project for about six months. Um, I was able to find 30 points of interest in our county that related to the underground railroad story, whether through slavery or abolition or uh, something like that. And um, I was able to document using primary sources, three safe houses in our county wow. and six routes of escape. And um, those were mainly discovered through uh, newspaper articles. I found runaway notices where roads were mentioned wow. or where um, uh, people were um, captured uh, as they were you know, transporting people out along those roads. And then, um, so I, I write my paper. Um, yes. Then the historical society where I had been um, volunteering at, one of the archivists there who knew I was doing the research said, you know, hey, I'd like to read your paper. And so I gave it to her and she's like, oh my gosh, this is really good we would like to uh, get a grant to see if we can publish this. Would you be interested in like, oh, yeah. And so they got a grant. Um, um, we had, I think 500 copies of the, of the paper published as a little book and driving guide. Um, and all 500 copies sold out in six months time. Wow. I'm sorry, six weeks. Wow. First wow. present, six weeks, not six months, wow. six weeks. Wow. And um, then it went into a second uh, printing. So I knew there was something. And then um, uh, the county school system and library system had bought up a bunch of them. Hmm. And so I started being asked to go speak in schools. Hmm. And um, uh, what I would do is um, wherever I was, I would talk about the Underground Railroad in general but mention specific sites or routes or figures that were as geographically close to the school as possible. So um, um, uh, for the first school I spoke to, um, uh, it's about two blocks from one of the old colonial highways that cuts through our county. Um, and I was telling the kids about different um, freedom seekers who had come up that road. And one boy asked me, he said, Mr. Cohen, were you afraid when you escaped on the Underground Railroad? <laughs> you know, thinking I was the runaway. And I'm like, no, kiddo. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that old. <laughs> None of this fine gray was happening back then. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but um, but um, it gave me an idea. And I was like, well, what if I were to follow one of these routes? Yeah. Um, 
travel as though, you know, by foot, boat, rail, anything that was available at the time, um, what would that be like? Would I find history? Would, you know, each section lead to a different section, to a different county, to a different state? Mm. And that's how I kind of hatched the idea of traveling to Canada uh, along the route. And then um, National uh, Vince de Forest at the National Parks. I don't even know how we initially hooked up. I have to reach out to Vince and ask him if he remembers. But I do know that um, uh, uh, somehow, uh, I think I did a presentation somewhere, and I said I was going to do this, you know, journey. And someone at the presentation called our local NBC affiliate. Mm. And uh, so one of the reporters called and said, hey, I want to interview you about your walk. And then I was like, oh, crap, I guess it's on. <laughs> I guess it's on. Because <laughs> I got to do it. <laughs> I got to do it. <laughs> I'd be walking. <laughs> so, 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 um, so I, I did the interview. That got so much po positive press that they then um, said, okay, we want to do a follow-up on the day you leave for Canada. So I agreed to that, and they did. And then um, that got so much press that they contacted the different NBC affiliates across the country. And so as I went along, um, you know, they'd send a crew out, they'd interview me, get the B-roll, send that back. And then the reporter in Washington would do the lead. And um, uh, so I think they did, I think it was a six part series. And the reporter, whose name is Suzanne Malvo, won the Emmy wow. for her coverage, was picked up by CNN. And uh, the rest is uh, uh, history. Wow. Um, the funniest part about that is when Suzanne um, went to CNN, she was um, one of the um, anchors uh, on uh, Anderson Cooper 360. Oh. And it turns out that there is an Anderson Cooper connection to my uncle. And one of the things I did was once I found him and knew more about his story, any person who came in contact, whether it was the judge um, in New York or the judge back in Savannah or his owner or people he met along the way, anytime I had a name, I would take that person and trace them down to present day descendants to see if by some long shot, the story of Patrick had some town passed down through their family. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when I was looking through the court of uh, uh, the, uh, the account from my great, great grandfather, uh, where he mentions Patrick coming with Sherman's army, he said he came with Sherman's army under the command of General Judson Hugh Kilpatrick. And I looked up Kilpatrick, and he his cavalry um, was the um, group that did all of the burning of Georgia and the pulling up of the railway ties. And so I put in um, Judson Kilpatrick descendants, and Gloria Vanderbilt's name came up. I was like, what? She's his great granddaughter, or was she's passed? Wow. And Anderson Cooper is her son. Wow. So Kilpatrick is Anderson Cooper's great great grandfather. Mm. And Patrick is my great great grand uncle. Wow. And immediately it was like a one two punch. I was like, Wait a minute! I gotta, I gotta talk with Anderson Cooper. Yeah, yeah. Tell him my story. <laughs> How do I reach him? And then 
again in the middle of the night, I was like, wait a minute. Susan Malvo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she owes me. <laughs> she owes me. She owes me. Yeah. She owes me a favor. That's right. So um yeah, it got it got it got stranger, but it's uh it, it, it it's been wow. it's been a, an interesting time. That's amazing. Um oh, yeah. That's amazing. I, wow. So, you know, you mentioned how you were looking for, you know, perhaps Patrick Sneed's story was passed down in other families. Was he passed down in your family at all? <coughs> you mentioned his, his um, I believe his, his nephew or his like great nephew. How did you, you know, how did you, you know, you said you started with someone, um, I believe, um Stetson or yeah so so I first saw the name Patrick Sneed because my great great grandfather who was a free black man named Jackson Sheptal S H E F T A L L he lived in Savannah he was born free um to a an African American mother and a Jewish father, and um, so he was never enslaved. And um, during the Civil War, um, he was in his twenties. Uh, well, actually, it just turned about thirty, um, and um, and uh, he was there when Sherman's army came in. Um, at the time, he was a butcher. That was his trade. And he had his own property, um, a house and uh, a butcher shop attached to it. And um, when the Union troops came in, they um, they basically seized his property. Because, uh-huh. you know, they were living off the land. So anything they needed to sustain troops, they, they would sustain. And... Um, so when they when they encountered someone from whom they would take property, if they thought the person was loyal to the union cause, they would give them a receipt mm-hmm. and say, well, you know, if and when we win the war, you can file for compensation. Mm-hmm. So in 1871, I think, um, uh, the Southern Claims Commission was filed was formed. And so people started filing claims. My great, great grandfather filed a claim for, I think it was $3,900 in property he lost. Um, Of course, you then had to go into court and uh, prove your claim. Hmm. Um, Those people who were able to prove their cases were given the money and just the verdict was preserved by the federal government that they had gotten these, these, this claim. Those who were denied a claim, um, the U.S. government kept their entire court transcript. My great-great-grandfather's claim was denied. Uh. And they did it based on the fact that during the war, um, he was forced to butcher meat for the Confederate Army. Gotcha. And he was just like, you know, I couldn't yeah. tell him no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, uh, in an interesting twist, um, um, the, you know, U.S. government would frequently bring in witnesses of its own, mm-hmm. often Confederates who would say, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. He, he was for the Confederate cause, right? <laughs> yeah. They could deny the claim. So he was denied his claim, but that's the only reason wow. we have his yeah. transcript. So in that transcript, when he's being interviewed, 52 pages of court, court testimony. Wow. Um, he reveals his lineage, um, uh, uh, minute details about what he was doing during the war. And he said um, that he had two uncles 
He said one was a man named Patrick Sneed who came with uh, Judson to Kilpatrick on Sherman's March. And he said um, the other one was a man named Robert Haynes, who he said he helped uh, to escape through Confederate um, lines to get to, I guess it was a Union gunboat. Almost sounds Robert Smallish, yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, but he didn't steal the boat. <laughs> but he became um, uh, a, a Union soldier, um, and um, and um, so so that's where that's where I first heard um, uh, about um, you know both of these people. Um, I still have not have yet to. Uh, find him um, in military records. Um, I do know for certain that when he lived in Canada and upstate New York, he had at least three aliases. And um, I think probably three more that I think I found him using. So who even knows wow. what he in, enlisted as. Mm-hmm. Right, right. But the fact that my my great great uh, grandfather knew the unit he was with, I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the most profound thing is um, the um, when Union troops came and dismantled his house and took all of his provisions, it was a uh, um, a unit uh, that was under Union General Oliver Otis Howard. Oh, wow. And my dad, the direct, you know, descendant, (laughs) uh, graduated from Howard University. Howard University, wow. Yes. So, you know, when when my father and I found that court transcript at first, you know, my dad, first of all, we were stunned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it it bridged that, you know, fu- you know, bust through that firewall of slavery and we're able to take then take the family back to the uh, early 1700s. Oh. Um, but, um, you know, my dad for for a moment was like, we we should we should try to get this claim Phil, you know you, we should we should we should uh you know submit this claim again you know we have every right to that and i'm like um okay yeah, we can try so, <laughs> just think of it this way dad he fed the troops <laughs> of the guy who gave you your degree essentially, <laughs> essentially. Exactly. we are not going to complain <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it's 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 really amazing. Yeah. So um okay. So this is this is on your father's side, you're saying this is like all this family is on your father's side. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Sorry for the long-winded thing. That's okay, that's okay. But this was where I first saw Patrick Sneed's name. I learned over time that when Patrick escaped, he escaped with someone identified as his half-brother, a man named Adam Mendenhall. And um, it wasn't until I saw Adam's name that I realized that my dad's grandfather, Charles Mendenhall Sheptel, um, must have been named after his yeah. uncle Adam. Um, nowhere else in our family is the name Mendenhall. Oh. My grandmother, who was the daughter of Charles Mendenhall Sheftel, um, early on when I saw his name, I was like, who's Mendenhall? She's like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Daddy never spoke about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am convinced that um his father jackson benjamin sheptel who uh you know had the civil war claim uh uh, gave his uncle's uh, you know last name 
as his son's middle name. Wow. So just the idea that those people may have been in the family memory with wow. names passed down that we had no idea of is just really spooky and really humbling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So how did you get to Jackson Sheftel first? Like, how did you, did you, what did you know about him? Like, how did you learn about his story? Well, when, <laughs> when my father and I started researching that line of our family, the first person we went to was my grandmother. Um, and she was born Ethel Palmer Sheftel. And so that was one of the first questions. Where's your name from? What does it mean? And um, um, she said that the name Palmer was the um, doctor who delivered her. Mm. And so her mother gave me her middle name, mm. took her middle name from the doctor. Mm -hmm. mm. And that Sheftel was a Jewish name um, that went back to the founding of Savannah. So... Wow. That turned out to be true. And so um, uh, in 1733, a few months after the colony opened for England, um, a group of Jewish immigrants came on a ship from London. Um, and one of the families were, were the Sheftels. Um, My fifth great grandfather, Benjamin Sheftel, founded the Jewish congregation in Savannah. Wow. Um, they, they, Israel still there wow. is the third oldest uh jewish congregation in north america wow. and the oldest one in the south and um and so we knew we had this name of you know these jewish um uh, uh folks but we didn't know how we were related um but i did know uh using like um uh, records, free free black records, um, that um, my great great grandfather Jackson was um, the son of a free black woman named Mar Mariah Mata, but we didn't know who his father was until his court testimony, where um, he has to bring forth witnesses to attest to his activities uh, during the war, which he did, but he also shows up on the witness list mm. for a white man mm. named Mordecai Sheftel. And when he was sworn in, the court said, please state your name and your relationship to the claimant. And he said, the claimant is my half brother, which then gave me his father. Um, and here's a black man saying that yeah. in a court with white people, with the white person, right, yeah. with the Jewish person in, in question sitting there. So right. um, it had to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until 2017, 18, where I took an ancestry DNA test, mm -hmm. which showed I'm 9% Ashkenazi Jewish. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of my matches were Sheftels. So I've been able to prove it. When I first asked my grandmother, uh, so I asked you know, her about her name, and she's like, I don't know how we ended up with the name. And I said, well, what was your father's name? And she said his name was Ben. So we kept looking up Ben Sheftels, and there was one, but he died. Um, uh, in the 1830s, so it couldn't have been her her thing. So after a while, um, you know, we're, we're looking like in the 1870 census and the 1880 census and the 1900 census because, you know, you can't, slaves aren't named. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my dad just decides, you know, I'm going to look up every Sheptel who was li living in Savannah. So he did. And there was one man named Jackson Sheftel. Mm. And when he looks, there is my grandmother's father, 
in his household, his sisters, the whole nine yards. And he's like, do you know someone, you know, my, my grandma, do you know someone named Jackson Sheptel? And she's like, yeah, that's my father. He's like, no, you said your father was Benjamin Sheptel. She said, well, his name was Jackson, but no one called him that. We called him Ben. And my dad was like, you know, how am I <laughs> to know that, right? This is how it works, right? Uh -huh. So um, so we spent, I think it was six months just getting to that point. The was all, always there. We were just asking the question in the wrong way. So, wow. Yeah, very interesting. That's, that's incredible. So what would you say your biggest insight was? coming away from this research project or some of your biggest insights? I think the biggest one is that history is all around us and we carry it with us. Right. And um, I think we have to constantly redefine or define or set the bar at what we deemed to be history mm -hmm. um i think of you know the history community and other scholars who will have their you know subject matter and their work in that they're trying to dig up the dirt on you know past events and people and whatnot mm -hmm. and you know i always say to my friends you know in this field don't forget that when you find something, you are bringing that history to the oh. surface and you're kind of making history yourself. So don't discount your own story. Your own story is part of the story that you're that you're seeking. That's right. Um, and so um uh you know, history is not only all around us, it's within us. And, and we have to have some ability to step back from our, you know, everyday um, grind, if you will, and just be able to visualize ourselves, you know, in the stream of time. You know, what are we doing right now? How does this, you know, our own lives, our own work uh, contribute to um the understanding of the past and who knows you know 50 years from now you have to wonder who's going to be looking at us yeah, and yeah. wondering what our story is yeah so um you know history is fun it's fun to dig it up but i also frequently feel the pressure of um i don't know my own work my own legacy if you will that doesn't sound too weird yeah no yeah, absolutely so yeah so how do you balance that what do you think about adding to your own like adding to your <clears throat> legacy how do you think about do you talk to your children about patrick sneed if you have children do you talk to your you know? i do not have children i have farm animals but <laughs> i have nephews <laughs> gotcha. nephews who think this story is crazy Mm. And um, and so um, I do that. Um, I'm currently writing. I'm going to call it a family history. It's about Patrick Sneed, but it's a combination of his story and my story, finding him mm -hmm. and the search for him. Mm. So you know, I'm trying to um, in this project um you know kind of do the passing of the baton um and uh you know chronicle you know my family's legacy through this story that was you know exhumed um and how i carry it uh, uh forward so yeah. we'll see yeah. That's incredible. I think that's yeah, that's my last question for you. Um that's yeah, I love hearing the story again. So I, I watched the interview, a first interview, I should say. We watched it maybe last week or the week before and just loved it. And hearing you talk again is really amazing. Patrick Sneed and you know Jackson 
Chef, Chef Yes. Um, this is just such an incredible story. I I want to be my own, I guess, but from both of my families. My mom's family is from Georgia, so she's from uh, Rome, Georgia. So that's like, what county is that? Yeah, what, what's the uh, surname? Uh, so her name would be Edwards. Edwards from a Floyd County. Yeah, Edwards. So that's my mom's like her maiden name, and that's their surname was Edwards. Have you um have you done um, ancestry DNA? I haven't, but I think one of my aunts did, or like one of my cousins did, or something. Who is your oldest living direct? Mm. Probably my great, my grandmother, probably my grandmother. So your grandmother's still alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so two things. Um, Ancestry has a Father's Day sale on, so you mm. can get the kit for $59. Okay. I would suggest that you buy one for yourself. Okay to get both of your parents' side, mm -hmm. just so you 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 got it. Cause you know, get yourself first and that way then you can work on your mm -hmm. family. Who knows, some people are reluctant to take though. Yeah. Um, but, um, and get one for your, <laughs> for your grand grandmother. And if, if she's uh, away from you, send it to her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or send it to someone who can help her take it mm -hmm. and be loving and encouraging if she's hesitant at first and if not just tell her mm -hmm. to do it <laughs> <laughs> grandma please sometimes we have, yeah sometimes yeah. we have to just tell yeah. her yeah yes please, please because okay. because that's going to connect you and um you know, I learned that after I took mine, that there's only so much information you can get from written records. And I was very lucky mm. to have gotten as much as I did, you know, prior to DNA from, you know, 20 years of family research. Mm -hmm. But DNA will blow your mind and it yeah. will it will open up your 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 family uh story so just a thought yeah absolutely i'll, I'll definitely look into that um well i don't have anything else for you mr cohen um it's been an honor and a pleasure to talk to you once again um thank you so much for your story and i really appreciate your time today yes and uh good luck with the project yes uh glad this was all happening and um yeah Okay, thank you. Thank you. Take care.